Welcome to the Dark Mind Podcast. Friends and familiars, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dark Mind Podcast, where we explore the boundless realm of dark literature and film. On today's show, we have a writer who has taken the concept of a collection of short stories and turned it into an elegant presentation of gothic brilliance. He's joining me today to talk about his new short story collection entitled Jack of All Trades. So without further ado, join me as we delve into the dark insight of Jack Wells. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this sixth day of January 2024. I looked back and oddly enough found that you were the fifth guest that I ever had since the inception of the podcast. So needless to say, it had been a while since we last spoke. So I was thrilled when I came across your collection of short stories entitled Jack of All Trades. And just as I suspected, not only were the stories highly original and literary, but the arrangement and presentation were as well. So I'm glad to have you on the show today so we can delve into the dark details. Happy to be back. Yeah, it's been a while. So instead of a simple one, two, three list of stories, there is the first story entitled See No Evil, which is structured like a symphony with four movements, with each movement separated by two standalone short stories. And you list the kind of characters that are going to be in the particular chapter as Dramatis Persona, I think it's pronounced, which is more akin to opera, I believe. Is that correct? Correct. So where did the inspiration for this arrangement come from? And why was there no intermission? I'm just kidding. Well, I <laughs> kind of consider the little drabble, the little hundred word literary drabble as the intermission. But <laughs> just the fact that these are mostly older stories taking place in bygone eras, I kind of wanted it structured a little differently than your traditional fiction. And because See No Evil by size could be considered a novel or a very big novella, I figured it would be best to kind of separate that out a little bit and give readers a chance to breathe a little bit. So that way it wasn't a bunch of little stories and here's this huge chunk of a story that takes up most of the book. So I thought I'd break it up a little bit, kind of offer up a different package for readers to peruse. Well, See No Evil combines the narratives of Jack the Ripper and the modern Prometheus, also known as Frankenstein. So could you kind of, talk about your interest in and what I assume to be love for these stories. And additionally, was the story meant to be somewhat meta, given that you were creating a narrative by dissecting two stories, kind of like Jack the Ripper and his victims, and then piecing those parts together, much like Dr. Frankenstein? So yeah, it's something about combining both realistic events or real events, as it were, real historical events with what I consider probably my favorite novel of all time, which is The Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, Frankenstein. And just kind of stitching those two together seemed to me like it hadn't been done or it's very rarely done. So I wanted to try something a little different, a little outside of my comfort zone, if you will, and take a real monster and a fictional monster and smash them together and see what I could come up with while also throwing just a little bit of Sherlock Holmes in there for good measure. So it started out as a much smaller tale. Mm -hmm. And then as the plot thickened, the characters kind of took on life, it kind of grew into this beast of now it's basically a small novel. So it was interesting how this kind of transformed from this really small tale to a really huge tale that I also 
really didn't finish. I left it open in a way that I could come back to it. And it's interesting that you mention meta because I'm always curious to see the people who read this, especially this story, if they caught all of the mixture of pop culture references that are both real and fictional in this story, because they're quite a bit threaded throughout. So yeah, it's a little bit meta in the sense that it is stitching together something. It's also meta in the fact that it introduces and incorporates a whole bunch of pop culture references that a lot of people maybe didn't get. Can you give an example? So we've got history here with Joseph Merrick, the elephant man and his doctor, Frederick Treves. That's real. I have a reference to Mrs. Lovett from Sweeney Todd. Even though originally that story took place in the late 1700s, a lot of people assume that it took place in Victorian England. So I was like, screw it. I'll just place it in Victorian England. I've also got references to the prestige, more the movie than the book. That movie was based off of a book. And while the book, I think, does reference what time period it takes place in, the movie does not. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to have this movie take place in my story as well. I've also got a reference to A Christmas Carol, a reference to Werewolves of London, the song. Mm. The Wolfman movie with Benicio Del Toro and Anthony Hopkins. And I even have a reference, very subtle, to Mary Poppins. Which part is that? Unless it's going to create a spoiler. No, no, no. He's reading Purcell's letter and Purcell's chasing down somebody who's poisoning kids. She's posing as a nanny and she's poisoning kids. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah. So it's real, real subtle. That one, at least. A little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. Uh Uh-huh. And that's how she's (laughs) poisoning them. Yep. (laughs) Got it. All right. So see no evil centers around a young prostitute named Constance, whose friend and roommate Fiona is murdered by a killer that is taking his victim's eyes and Constance being no stranger to violence and having to defend herself from her very frequently dangerous occupation resolves to find the killer and kill him herself. And in many ways, Constance's determination to seek justice for Fiona mirrors a classic hero's journey. So how did you approach character development and growth in the context of her story? It's important to me when I write long form fiction, at least, that we have a character arc. In Monochrome Noir, that was Charlie. Charlie had the major character arc in the story. And for me, I wanted Constance in this story to have that kind of growth. And like you were saying, that hero's journey that she undertakes. And it's always important for me that if I'm going to have a female character, it's going to be tough in a certain sense. I don't want that toughness to be a masculine toughness that is just stitched onto a woman character. I think some authors will just take a male character and slap some boobs on it. It's like, there you go. And it's like, (laughs) sure, I guess that could work at times. But when I look back at like the tough women in my life, they were still very feminine and they were still very fragile in certain ways, but they didn't let that stop them. And that to me is the ultimate bravery is they're not trained. They're not from this history where they have to deal with this stuff in a certain way, but they step up and they do it anyways. And that to me is always very impressive. Hmm. Well, could you tell us about the world building and atmosphere you aim to create within the story? Specifically, how did you capture the unique atmosphere associated with London, the London fog, the nighttime slayings of the victims of Jack the Ripper? Because you mentioned the docks, and that makes me think about, like you mentioned already, Sweeney Todd, you know, there's no place like London pulling up on the boats. The women of the night in, it was the Whitechapel district, is that correct? Correct, yep. Yeah, and the darkness, the red light district, London's East End, the docks, all of that. It's a lot of research, really. It's reading both fictional and non-fictional accounts of uh, life in that time. Actually looking up a lot of old letters and correspondence that were sent back and forth between the residents of London. One of those things that I always find interesting is that a lot of the movies that take place in Victorian England kind of pretty it up. And to be fair, there were parts of England during that time that were very pretty, but a lot of it weren't. And you mentioned Sweeney Todd, there's no place like London. When he's coming back to London on the boat and you see London and it's mostly just fog and kind of ugly, that's really how it was back then. And I mentioned in my book, the pea super is what they call the London fog because it's so thick. And that was legitimately what they called it. And so researching all this stuff kind of opened my eyes a little bit, stripping back some of the rose-tinted glow of what we think Victorian England was like, and it was not like that. And so I found it really interesting to try to incorporate realism into the story wherever possible. 
yes, there's fictional elements taking place, but I really want it to feel like it's a real place because that's how London really felt back then. Mm -hmm. And why does it have such a fog? I mean, I know it's like technically a port city. Yeah, it was really two reasons. Well, three. It was naturally foggy being so close to the rivers and the ocean. Yeah, it was a port city. But there was also so much expansion taking place. This is like right after post-industrial revolution. So now it's full of machines and factories, and they're just belching all this stuff into oh. the air constantly. So you've got this like perfect storm of real fog. So there's also London smog. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's just, I don't know. I think it was just a combination of all these things in a place where they don't have a lot of mountains. So I guess the wind could pull it away sometimes, but a lot of times it just stayed there it just hovered there yeah i work in an industrial district i don't work for the industry but it's definitely in a major industrial district and i've noticed <laughs> it's kind of a common thing that everybody knows when it rains whatever type of aircraft they use to kind of monitor the releases of these institutions they always do it when it's raining because, you know, it's cloudy and they can't see. So they'll they'll burn off all of the, um, I forget yeah. what they call it, flaring, I think is what they call it. Uh, <laughs> so then you've got that stuff hanging low from the moisture. It's pretty nasty. <laughs> yeah. Well, Inspector Guthrie is the main sleuth involved in the case. And instead of making him a super sleuth like Sherlock Holmes, you make him very human, very intelligent but still very human. Could you delve into his vulnerabilities and how they impact his approach to solving the case? For me, the more engaging stories are the ones where you take an ordinary person and you put them in extraordinary situations. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the Marvel movies and I love superheroes and video game protagonists that are overpowered. That can be fun to an extent. But if you want to really dive into what makes us human, then you have to, I think, examine our frailties and our vulnerabilities and our fears. And so I always want my main characters to have foibles and to be imperfect. And so for me, it was a matter of how can I take what I would consider kind of just an average guy who just happens to really be invested in his job and wants to solve these murders. It's not just about a paycheck. He genuinely wants to make the street safer. Mm -hmm. And how can I put him in these situations where he's way over his head, but he is determined to get to the bottom of it. So I don't know. I just try to imagine what it would be like for a normal person who is kind of deductive mm -hmm. mentally and throw them in the situation and see what they can come up with. And I think that's part of the fun is to take a character and throw something at them. And then I got to figure out from their mindset, how are they going to figure it out? How are they going to get out of this situation? And that to me is part of the fun of writing is to solve these little mysteries as I go. Mm. Well, in what way does Guthrie's humanity, I mean, you kind of already answered it, but specifically, does it add depth to the storytelling and the portrayal of the investigation specifically? Well, I kind of look at him as like a precursor to male feminist, you know, where he has no preconceived notions or any kind of bias against the female gender in any roles whatsoever. He's surprised by it when he meets the ministry official. He's really surprised by the fact that she is the first electrical engineer to come out of Oxford, you know, as mm. a female it blows his mind, but he's not against it. He's just shocked. And so I think for me, it was a question of how can I take this kind of more modern mindset where men are kind of getting away from those pre-established gender roles and all those biases and kind of throw that back into a time where that was very prevalent. It was almost expected where if you weren't like that, it was probably something was wrong with you, you know, but I kind of want him to get the precursor to men kind of getting more in, in touch with their feminine side or their softer side, or at least their emotional side, because, you know, I've always maintained that being an emotional person, especially as a man, allowing yourself to feel and show emotions is not weakness. It's actually mm. strength. Hiding it away, that's weakness. That's cowardice. Pretending that you don't have emotion. That's not strength. That's weakness. And so I wanted to give him real emotion, real kind of drive beyond just the job to solve these grisly murders and to make his city safer. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely healthy masculinity and toxic masculinity. A lot of people consider all masculinity toxic, but that's definitely not true. Yeah, I would disagree with that. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of the woman that you alluded to, Lady Ellington is a woman dubbed as England's first electrical engineer, which is impressive, but doesn't seem like a qualification for involvement in a murder investigation. She's assigned to the case by the Ministry of Special Sciences and is on special appointment from Parliament. So while her involvement in the investigation makes total sense by the end of the story, the question was, what role does her status as the first female in a traditionally male-dominated field play in the narrative, which you just kind of explained? But how is it involved in... I don't know if there's the chance of a spoiler being revealed here, but I mean, Parliament is basically tantamount to the government, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. How does it give her the edge with the government in getting assigned to this for if it's not a spoiler, an ulterior motive? So that's a good question. And I kind of take into account all these things that I've read about these various ministries that were either in effect during this time or being brought into effect in this time. Now, the Ministry of Special Sciences is obviously a fictional creation, Mm -hmm. but it did seem like at the time in England, there were all these ministries that were either popping up or had already been established. And it was almost like, oh, my gosh, that's like a committee, like another committee, really? Another one, another one. And so I wanted to kind of give that kind of farcical concept initially here she is just some other government official coming in to make things worse and then she basically shows up everybody including Guthrie and how with how smart she is and I wanted her to be like the perfect foible or counterpoint to him Mm -hmm. where he's going through the motions very doggedly very persistently checking off the boxes as he goes doing what he has to do and he knows how to get his job done where she's kind of this rebel or rogue if you will kind of coming in you know completely stunning everybody with the fact that she is a female electrical engineer at a time when women did not get degrees Mm. and really kind of showing up all those around her. And her involvement is because at this time in London's history, some of the city was receiving electricity and some were slated to get it. So the Limehouse district and the docks, they were slated to get it several years after the events of this book. Then that's actually a real thing. Mm. So I wanted to tie in kind of the electrical side of what we consider most Frankenstein stories, right? We're Mm -hmm. harnessing electricity and that's actually not how it happened in the book. But when a lot of people think about Frankenstein, they think of it's alive, you know, and the creations with electricity. Yeah, the bolts in the neck. and Right. So I kind of wanted to tie that in in a way, even though that's not true to the actual original story, but in people's mind it is. So I thought it would be kind of cool to bring that in at a time when this was a very big part of London's modernization. And you know, the way you wrote her as far as the way she interacted with people and her mannerisms, it's like this strikingly powerful elegance. Was she based on anybody or is she just kind of like your idealization of the perfect woman or (laughs) no, I actually really wanted her to be kind of this dichotomy where her origin is very plain. She was not royalty when she got married, Mm -hmm. but she was smart. She was considered kind of a prodigy, but she was pretty much just an average Joe. And I kind of wanted to look into it because there's two sides to money. There's Mm -hmm. people that are born into it and there's people that marry or win it in the lottery, whatever they come into it later. And it's interesting to me how some people change when that happens and some people don't. And I wanted to kind of visit and and really examine what happens to this plain, ordinary woman who gets married into royalty and how she basically molds herself into this very powerful, respected, you know, strong, but also kind of haughty, a little full of herself person. And that in my mind, in this instance, that wealth and that power does change her. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I wasn't thinking about later on in the book. I'm thinking more of her first interaction with Guthrie on the dock. Well, I also wanted it to be kind of fun. She's having fun. Yeah, yeah. She's out here doing what no other woman in London's history has ever done. Uh And I think it's akin to going out in the field for the first time for anybody who's been stuck in an office and they're very smart, they're very good, but they want to go out. They want to be on, you know, in the field. They want to be doing the hands-on stuff and she's having the time of her life. And so she's kind of forgetting the fact that she's royalty, that she's one of the powerful women of England and she's just having a good time playing out in the field with dead bodies. (laughs) (laughs) 
as some women are wont to do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My wife loves true crime. I think she would play with the bodies if she could. <laughs> See, right? <laughs> Well, the character of R.M. Muller is fascinating because he embodies the archetype of the mad scientist in the story. And he comes across as cold, calculating, rarely displaying emotion, unless it's in response to a breakthrough in his experiments. And his willingness to break the law and ethical boundaries gives the impression that he fancies himself as kind of a godlike figure. And interestingly, I couldn't help but notice that his surname Muller is of German origin. So could you elaborate on whether his character was inspired by the Nazi Dr. Mengele and provide more insights into his background and motivations? He wasn't inspired necessarily by Mengele, but he was really inspired by just the German science machine of World War II in general, where a lot of these really awful experiments took place. And to them, I mean, it was terrific and it was awful, but a lot of them just viewed it as also kind of an insight into progress. So it was torture, but they also were like trying to learn things about the human physiology. And unfortunately, in a lot of medicine and not just from this time period, but in most medicine that we take for granted now came from really awful experiments. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of capture that feel it wasn't really my intent to necessarily say, hey, look, all, all German scientists are evil, because that's you know, certainly not the case. <laughs> but I really did want to tie into that World War II, even though that obviously hasn't happened yet. I wanted to tie into that clinical, cold German scientist who is trying to create something new and trying to make his mark in the field of medicine and science. And also, in a sick way, trying to advance human understanding and the human race as a whole. So mm -hmm. yeah, I guess he would consider himself a little godlike. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, it started making me think about, you know, not just German scientists, American scientists. There are some people, I don't know if they're technically sociopaths or they're just so fixated on finding out the answer. It's like a puzzle that they just have to solve that they do unethical things like, you know, the first thing that pops into my head is like the Tuskegee experiments. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I think what were they working on? Uh, syphilis is yeah. what they were studying. So I could be wrong, but I think the end goal was supposed to be benevolent, but they were doing <laughs> these highly unethical experiments on people that didn't even know that it was happening to them. You know what yeah, they were that, doing. Yep. Yeah. And that to me is an interesting kind of concept where somebody can get so fixated on what they're doing that the morality of it just kind of fades into the background and it's the afterthought, if it's even a thought is all. Mm -hmm. And I would say I, that would be some kind of sociopathic behavior because you don't care. The emotions of others do not impact you in any way. It is all about your goal and what you're fixated on. So and it yeah. is interesting to visit people's mindsets that are a little different than our own, you know, and kind of outside the norm, if you will. It's almost like our fascination with serial killers and why we're so fascinated with people that break all these cardinal rules of humanity. And so in this case, in his case, it's pretty similar. Yeah. Well, speaking of sociopath, <laughs> the character of Schaefer, who is responsible for procuring specimens for Moeller's work, is an absolute monster. And the plot element involving these starving women of the night forced into selling their bodies just to survive and then being kidnapped, tortured, and murdered is very gut-wrenching. And some authors I talked to express their love for delving into these dark themes in their writing because they find it cathartic. Others admit that they need emotional palate cleansers after working on particularly dark scenes. And in some cases, if the entire story is consistently dark, they may take a break and work on something else before returning to it at a later date. Which of these personality profiles best describes your approach to writing and handling dark themes? Well, most of my stuff is dark, so mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have a problem with it per se. It is a little cathartic, if you will, but there are times with certain characters and Schaefer especially where it can get a little intense because I can't speak for other writers, but I almost have to put myself in the mindset of the character that I'm writing so that I can understand how they're going to react in certain situations, what they're going to do next, their thought processes. And so it can get a little much. 
And I think that's one of the main reasons that you typically will find sardonic or wry humor in my stories, because that's mm-hmm. kind of my way of kind of releasing a little of that tension and pressure in myself as I'm delving into these dark things is to kind of throw some humor at it, mm-hmm. you know, soften it up a bit. Yeah. Talking about getting into the mind and mindset. So you're like a, a literary Will Graham from Red Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kind of like that. You know, He went a little crazy, though. You better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Gaze too long into the abyss. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great story, and I won't reveal whether or not it has a happy ending. Readers will just have to find that out for themselves. But your next story, her first time, is about a small town called Harper's Hollow, founded by a reclusive, wealthy family of immigrants from England. And many rumors circulate about the family due to their refusal to leave their massive estates, such as rumors of them being vampires, witches, or warlocks. And the main character is a young woman named Madeline who is blind and is making a trek to the town fair to meet a young man for what you might call a romantic rendezvous. In your writing, how do you approach portraying a character like Madeline who has a unique perspective due to her blindness? And what challenges and opportunities did this character present in the storytelling? It's a good question. And... I think I tend to make things a lot more difficult than they need to be in most of my writing. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, let's take a character and take away the one thing that almost every character in any kind of narrative has in that site. Hmm. How can I then make a compelling story by removing her ability to see anything? And it's always interesting to me because I've, I've been reading a lot online lately there's this whole argument about men shouldn't write female characters. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that because on the one hand, I can kind of see where some of these proponents of that theory come from, because a lot of times I'm going to say a lot of times, but in very egregious circumstances, like I was saying earlier, a a guy will just take a guy and slap some boobs and (laughs) here's a girl, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's like, no, they're, We have similarities to be sure, but we also view things differently and think about different things differently. So it's really interesting for me to try to get into the mindset of a female character, let alone a character that's blind. And so one of the things I tried to do was, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell. No. And his whole life is being narrated by an actual writer. She's writing out his life. And this author you see her in instances where she's sitting out in the rain, like a downpour because she's trying to capture all the essence of a downpour. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting take on things. And so in this instance with this character, with Madeline, I'm already kind of blind anyways, I got shitty eyes, but (laughs) I was like, okay, let's just sit in this room with my eyes closed. Let's just sit in this room with a blindfold on or whatever and just listen. And then try to imagine what is her life like in post-World War II America if she goes to this fair, but she can't see anything. So what is she going to hear? What is she going to smell? You know, and so I really had to focus on all of her other senses, even touch. She senses that the guy that sits next to her is heavier because the way the bench moves and kind of slides her toward him. And so it was interesting to kind of take away sight and really bring all these other senses to the fore where a lot of times those are the things that get the short shrift in a story and we just get the visual descriptors of things. So it was kind of a backwards take on writing, if you will. You really immerse yourself in your characters. It's almost like, who am I thinking of? Oh, what was the name of that? Um, well, we can even say Christian Bale because like there's movies where he goes all in and there was one where he was portraying a guy who was anorexic and he basically lost oh, weight, God. right? The machinist, the machinist. The machinist. Yeah. yeah. To me, if I'm going to write a character, that's going to be a main character and have some significant page time. I really want to get into what makes them tick and who they are. So I will dive in as much as possible into that character and try to be mentally anyways, that character. Daniel Day-Lewis, he stays in character 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the project's completed. Like he goes (laughs) home to his wife as Abraham Lincoln. Right. So (laughs) I was like, that may be something you want to try. Drive your kids crazy. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I mean, these again, I can't speak for other authors. But for me, when I'm writing a story, especially a story that has any kind of link to it, I do tend to just kind of get stuck in that time period. So I'll get stuck in that mindset of the vernacular and the descriptors and the way of speaking. I won't necessarily talk that way, 
but it does drive my kids crazy because I'm always <laughs> mentally there. And so then I'm kind of talking about it. My kids are just like, dad, please shut up. You know? <laughs> Terry, not children. Clean up your... (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Well, the story deals with very gothic elements of love, sadness, death, grief, and the supernatural. And gothic literature also has a rich tradition of symbolism and metaphor. And you already spoke about the pop references Are there any symbols or metaphors in your story that you'd like to highlight and discuss in relation to the themes you've explored? Not necessarily any metaphors so much as I really wanted this to be almost or a lot of my mysteries aren't necessarily like the whodunit until the last page. I don't write mysteries like that. But this story, I kind of wanted it to be a misdirect where by the title and the topic and the things that she's kind of talking about. There's a little bit of an unreliable narrator there where you mm-hmm. do think it's about a romantic rendezvous. And then you realize that's not necessarily what it's about, you know? Um, so not no, any metaphors so much as just kind of a, a hoodwink of the reader and a twisting of expectations. I also really wanted to bring forth kind of a lost, like what I consider a lost art anyways, where it's a lot more subtlety when it comes to the eroticism and the sexuality in these stories. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times in modern literature, it's just thrown at you. Like everything's thrown at the wall. Let's see what sticks. And I kind (laughs) of wanted to take it back to older stories where a lot of it was alluded to. And it was a lot of subtle hints and looks, not so much actions. So I really wanted it to feel like an old school kind of dark romance, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really impressive element of the story. It also delves into the theme of retribution. Exploring retribution can lead to unexpected consequences and moral dilemmas. So were there any challenges or surprises you encountered while incorporating this theme into your story? Uh, no, I have a pretty interesting view on retribution and vigilantism because I am of the mindset that if something terrible happens to somebody that I love, mm-hmm. there's probably retribution in my blood. And, you know, <laughs> I say that, you know, with a big grain of salt mm-hmm. as far as knock on wood that nothing like that ever happens. Mm-hmm. But if anything ever happened to my children, I don't think I'd be able to allow due process to take place. If somebody hurt my kids, mm-hmm. I would probably take action into my own hands and not even think twice about it. So I think about it in the mindset that, yes, we have these moralities and, you know, she is not inherently an evil person, but somebody that she loved was taken from her and she is going to set it straight. Mm -hmm. And that to me is noble in a very illegal (laughs) way. (laughs) And I'm not saying go out and do these things, but I'm just... (laughs) But I get it. And I can't say with any honesty that I would not do the same thing. And go full on Wyatt Earp. You tell him I'm coming and (laughs) hell's coming with me. (laughs) Yep. Uh, Well, the next story entitled Psycho Killer, catchy title, by the way, is about a serial killer that doesn't kill so much for a sense of power, but to have subjects for his artistic endeavors. And artistic expression often carries subjective interpretations. So how does the story explore the concept of art as a subjective and sometimes unsettling concept? So I wanted to tell the story of, I can't really call him a serial killer because he's more of a mass murderer. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take the traditional elements out where he has these urges and he just has to satisfy these urges. Where he's satisfying urges, but he's doing it because he finds it beautiful and because he's trying to capture it for all eternity in pictures and photographs. And so to me, it was a very interesting deconstruction of the traditional killer who's killing because he wants to kill because he needs to kill because he's got a hole within him that he tries to fill with killing. There is an element of that, but I really wanted that antagonist to feel like he's doing it for a larger purpose. He's doing it because he finds it beautiful and he finds it timeless. And I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting kind of alternative take on why somebody would do these killings where he's basically almost reenacting scenes and he's making them a reality 
and then capturing them for all time so he can come back to them later. It's not even really a sexual gratification thing for him in, in this instance with that particular scene. It's just because he found it so breathtakingly beautiful and clinical, you mm-hmm. know. So it's, I don't know, I thought it was a, a unique take on why somebody would kill a bunch of people. Yeah, just like a sort of aesthetic bliss. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, listeners at home, if you're curious, yes, the Talking Head song Psycho Killer is featured <laughs> in the story. So Psycho Killer is known for its distinctive lyrics and mood. How did you select this specific song and what made it the perfect choice for your story? Which would make sense if you came up with the title first. But did the chicken come before the egg or vice versa? No, actually, the title came first. So this story takes place in the 80s. And what you might not know is that this story is actually a monochrome noir offshoot with Detective Little from that book from that series okay so this is taking place in the 80s uh, in los angeles or angel city as it's now known Mm -hmm. and so that song would have been very popular it's still popular now but that song would have been very popular at that time and back in those days most places had a jukebox most social places had a jukebox and i thought how cool would it be to have this literal title of Psycho Killer while that song is actually playing on repeat in the diner, which would have been a thing back then, except, you know, the repeat part that we handled that and kind of tie it together that way and give this song, which is a lot of people are like, hey, that's a cool song and give it kind of these sinister undertones. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of a strange song in that it's, Darkly emotional, but it's got this undercurrent of humor kind of floating around in it. Yeah. Interesting song ties together well with kind of the feel of the story. I thought so. Yeah. Well, the next story, Riding the Ghost Train, centers around a man who, after striking his wife in anger for the first time, resolves to lock himself away in an isolated cabin owned by his family in an effort to dry out and overcome his alcoholism. And despite being an alcoholic and having committed a terrible act, I found myself admiring him because instead of simply moving on after his wife forgave him, he made the resolution to quit drinking with the hope of preventing such incidents from happening again. So did you feel the same way? And if not, what was your opinion of the character and what feelings were you attempting to evoke in the reader in response to this character? I kind of wanted a more tragic hero take on this one, where this story was initially intended for a gothic anthology. And at the time, I had never attempted to write anything gothic. But my first literary loves were the gothic stories, Dickens and Poe and all these classic authors. I love that style of very evocative storytelling their narratives are so beautiful and so powerful even though if you read those stories not a lot necessarily happens by today's standards where they'll go on for paragraphs about how a house looks and it never feels (laughs) like it's dragging on because it's so beautifully done Mm -hmm. and i wanted to capture that feel with a character who is kind of a tragic hero in a way i mean what he did was not heroic in striking his wife but the mindset even back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when this story takes place, is that was kind of not a big deal. It was a big deal. But as far as society was concerned, you didn't go to jail for that. That was, I'm not going to say it was expected, but it wasn't uncommon by any means. And it didn't have the stigma that it does today. But I wanted a character who felt that stigma and felt like he had basically betrayed himself in his marital vows to protect and love and cherish this woman. And because he, was under the influence of addiction, he lashed out at her. And I have a very strong opinion on addiction, you know, and so I wanted to kind of incorporate that into my story, but allow this person to face that addiction on his own terms and try to beat it on his own terms, which I think anybody who beats addiction, I mean, my hat is off to them always. It's very impressive when somebody can actually like beat an addiction like that. And so I kind of wanted to to capture that a little bit of that um, hope in this very kind of gothic tale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most heartrending part of that is that she forgives him and I guess is more than willing to just go on as if it never happened, but he still is like, no, 
that is not acceptable. I'm going to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. So the story has a very supernatural narrative, but to me, it seemed like a man succumbing to the throes of delirium tremens all by himself. Was that what was happening? And can you expand on that concept? So I love that you use that term because that is the, exactly the term that I had in my head when I was first conceptualizing this story. And that whole concept comes from a movie called The Lost Weekend, which I think came out in like 1948 or 45. And as, as far as I know, it was the first Hollywood movie, if you will, to really expose and show the dark sides of alcoholism and to really capture that delirium tremens kind of head on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't glamorizing liquor back then by any means. It was really saying, hey, here's the ugly side of trying to get off of this addiction. So the whole point of this story is that it could be either one. And I wanted it to feel like maybe it's all in his head because people that experience really bad withdrawals when they're on delirium tremens have hallucinations and they're losing their mind. And so I wanted to explore that in a way that the reader can ask the question, is this really happening to him? Is it all in his mind or are these supernatural elements that are coming in? Are they actually real? So that I'm not going to answer because I want the reader to take away what they take away from it. Mm. I know what it is to, for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's part of the joy of the story, I think, is that it can go either way. And whether you believe in the supernatural or not, you'll take something away from it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in the course of my job speaking to a physician that was the medical director of a rehab center, and he was talking about how of all of the addictions, even heroin, the one instance that it happens is with alcohol, where somebody that's been drinking, you know, just ridiculous amounts, like a fifth of gin or whatever a day for years upon years, once they get to a certain point in a certain age, and they come to him for help, he sometimes has to tell them like, no, you cannot take alcohol withdrawal, just keep drinking. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which is fucking dark. <laughs> Damn, man. Yeah, that's like... That's like, yeah, you're, you're fucked. Just, <laughs> just drink yourself to death yeah. at that point. Oh my mean, gosh. Try and moderate, yeah. you know, just keep the shakes and the tremens away, but don't stop or you'll probably yeah. die and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Yeah. Well, that's a good point, though. And one of the things that was fascinating to me when looking into all these addictions is that, you know, as a modern society, we look at meth and crack and all these other things that people get addicted to and then withdraw from. And we look at that and go, oh my gosh, those are awful. And when we think of withdrawal, I think we typically tend to think in those regards, kind of discounting the fact that alcohol withdrawals can be just as awful. Yeah. Yeah. Alcohol is no big deal because it's socially accepted. <laughs> it's not dangerous right. at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think you alluded to it earlier as being the intermission but the stowaway was a piece of what I guess you would consider flash fiction that I would describe as epic alliteration. So <laughs> how was the insertion of a story like this midway through the collection intended to impact the overall flow of the book? So this was my one moment of, I don't have an ego, but this is my one moment of kind of showing off. You have to answer the question alliterative. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all screwed then. <laughs> I got invited to write to this collection of drabbles, which are 100 word stories, no more, no less, literally 100 words. And I was like, okay, how can I make this as hard as possible? Because that's just how I do that. Like, if I'm going to write something, I'm always going to make it as hard as possible. I don't know why. It's a mental defect or something. So not only do you have to tell, or I felt like I had to tell a self contained story in 100 words. But I was like, hey, why not make it as alliterative as possible just to make it that much harder? But it's part of, I guess, what I love about writing is that it's a challenge to myself. I do have imposter syndrome and I sometimes feel like I should not be doing this. But I'm also like, hey, let's take a concept and throw a whole bunch of other rules onto it and see if you can do it. Just, you know, kind of expanding my craft, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I had two goals with this particular little story was that it had to be as alliterative as I could make it. And it had to have a definitive beginning, middle and end, because as far as I'm concerned, stories should have a beginning, middle and end. I read a lot of Drabble's prior to doing this project, which this whole book was in service of a care home for at-risk youth, which I was like, I'm all in for that. But a lot of the stories I read 
seemed just kind of like a snapshot in time where they weren't a self-contained story. They were just a thing that happened. They were just a moment. And I'm like, no, I want mine to have an arc to start and to finish. And so I don't know whether I pulled it off or not, I guess it's up to the readers. But that one was for only 100 words was ridiculously difficult because I made it. (laughs) Yeah. So that was a challenge to yourself that didn't come from somebody else. It was. Yeah. Okay. Because I was thinking maybe somebody put you up to it and you were like, hold my beer. (laughs) No. Well, so there is some truth to that. So in my little online group of friends, I'm kind of the alliterative ones when we do message back and forth. And I love alliteration in all my stories. You'll find alliteration in almost all my stories because to me, it enhances the narrative if used sparingly. Mm -hmm. The the mind kind of fixates on words that rhyme or that start with the same letter. We have these mental cadences that we tend to follow. And so if I'm trying to get a point across in my story or make a passage really meaningful, I will throw some alliteration in there because whether consciously or not, the mind picks up on it. And if these ever go, to audiobook, which I do hope will do that down the road, there's a certain lyrical quality to it when you say it out loud. So I just love alliteration. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I read it to my wife last night. I forget how we got on the subject of alliteration. I think she accidentally said something alliterative. And I said, Oh, nice alliteration. And I was like, Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. I got to let you listen to this. She was like, How the hell did you even say that? <laughs> because I kind of spouted it out real quick. Yeah. How did you say that? <laughs> Well, the next story entitled The Sentimental Ending revolves around a young man named, is it Raj? Short for Roger? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's Roger, but Raj. Okay. Yeah. Revolves around a young man named Raj who is traveling by plane for the first time to visit Norway and see the location where a video game he was obsessed with had been filmed. And there is mention of him being a fan of symphonic Norwegian metal. And when I read that, the first thing that popped into my mind was Dimmu Borger. So could you elaborate on the specific type of Norwegian symphonic metal you were referring to in the book? Well, it's kind of all over the map, but Dimmu Borger is in there. One of my favorite bands is Camelot. Okay. It's very symphonic metal, male vocalist, very operatic vocals at times, but still pretty heavy, not thrash heavy, but pretty heavy. But I love that whole kind of juxtaposition of soft melody and symphony elements, strings and horns and stuff kind of interspersed with power chords and, you know, double bass drums and growls and stuff. So it's not just Norwegian metal that I love. I love most of that European symphonic metal, if you will, but it's bands like Dimmu Borgir, Tristania, Sirenia and all these bands. I love that. And I wanted him to have kind of more of a tie to this area where he was going other than just, oh, hey, a game I like was filmed here. I also love the music because for me, I'm a music lover. Mm -hmm. Music plays a heavy part in a lot of my stories. So I wanted to also have it play a part in this one. Yeah, I went to a Cannibal Corpse show and I had no idea who was opening for them. And it was Dimmu Borger. Oh, I was like, they, they awesome left the show. stage. I was like, well, no, where are they going? <laughs> Bring them back. Bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Can you imagine being, I imagine the person that's going to conduct the orchestra is the first person to know what's going on. But I don't know if there's auditions or whatever. Like, this is who you're going to be playing. With. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure for some of them, it's quite eye opening. Yeah. Like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. The title, The Sentimental Ending, refers to one of the 30 possible outcomes in Raj's game, which was called Menace in the Mountains. This particular ending captivates Raj as it involves a seductive encounter with a waitress. And this reminded me of the AI girlfriend apps flooding my Instagram feed. And during a uh, recent interview with Kenneth Wenger, who is an AI research and development expert, I asked him about the implications of developments like that. And he said basically that it's, you know, sad that there are some individuals that due to probably more personality than appearance struggle to find genuine human connections. So If it has to be that way, is it really so bad that they find solace in a digital companion? So I was curious to know, what are your thoughts on immersive gaming, virtual reality, and the relationships they offer in today's world? Oh, that's a really good question, because I'm an introvert, Mm -hmm. both in person 
and even online. My online footprint is pretty small. Yeah. And that's just by choice. It's not that I can't converse. I can converse on a wide range of topics. I just typically choose not to. I just, I'm a quiet person. I'm a private person. I used to play video games quite a bit. I still play them every now and again when I have time, which is basically never. But <laughs> I have no problem with the fact that people are finding happiness and fulfillment in a digital world where I struggle. And this isn't just pertinent to games and virtual reality, but anything where you immerse yourself too much, right? Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, everything in moderation, everything in life should be in moderation, you know, and by making that the sole interaction, if you are somebody who struggles with personal connections, if you are somebody who struggles with social situations, then going full hog into a digital realm is not going to help you in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, so you may be very adept in a digital environment, but if you ever have to interact in the real world, now you're even further behind. So as far as I'm concerned, all that stuff, there's nothing wrong with it. If you find your group online, if you find your love digitally, I have no problem with that as long as it's done in moderation. Anything to extremes is bad mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, and I imagine the digital companions probably don't, I mean, I guess you could probably program it or something to be uh, disagreeable, but I imagine they pretty much <laughs> like whatever you say and agree with everything you say. So it's probably a recipe for developing severe narcissism. <laughs> Correct. And that's where I also feel that we as a society are kind of failing. And that's another reason I have a small footprint on social media is there's all these arguments. Everybody just wants to argue over opinions. And it's all of a sudden it's like, well, if you don't like this opinion, unfriend me. You know, and it's like whatever happened to just healthy discourse, yeah. whatever happened to healthy disagreements. Again, we're tending as a society to really go extremes now. You know, if you're into it, you have to be all the way into it. And it's like, no, you don't. You know, and you can actually believe something without kind of being a dick about it you know it's mm -hmm. okay to believe something and also to allow other people to have their opinions and to view those opinions are valid they are valid they may not be valid to you but they're valid to them and that does not make them invalid opinions and so i don't know again by diving too much into it i think it harms us in other ways yeah yeah and i think the ease of which people say, well, if you don't agree with me, unfriend me. It's kind of like the friend they're talking to is probably solely an online friend, which really don't have right. as much worth <laughs> as, you know, somebody they know personally. So True. they're kind of easily disposable friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Friends in air quotes. Yeah. You know, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Listeners at home, air quotes going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, is there any way without giving away the end of the story that you can convey the ultimate message you were trying to express? In this one, it was the dangers of what I consider fanaticism. I know that being a fan is the root of fanaticism, but to me, being a fan is appreciating something. Being a fanatic is being so immersed in it and blind to any faults or failures, you know, and that to me is kind of an indictment on that fanatic culture. And I'm not just talking about video games, although even in that realm, things are getting, as far as I'm concerned, way out of hand where somebody doesn't agree with this one design decision on a game and all of a sudden they're review bombing it. And it's like, mm. holy hell, it's just one thing, you know, chill out. <laughs> but people can't seem to chill out. And so this story was kind of my indictment of that culture where people take things so seriously and get so immersed and they make it their entire life, which, OK, but is that really healthy? And I personally don't think it is, you know, again, moderation is key, but he gets so invested in this story and so invested in reenacting, if you will, this video game that he's so in love with, that he is ignoring the real world around him, which I think is a very real problem that we get so fixated on something that we're kind of blind to everything else, if you will. Yeah. Well, the last story, entitled A Frontier Haunting, is set in a small frontier town and involves mythical monsters from Norse mythology. And given your references to Norwegian metal and Norse mythology, do you have a particular interest in Scandinavia? I do. I love the culture. I love the mythology and the history. So 
whether it's intentional or not, some of that crops up in my stories. And I just find it a very fascinating culture and a very fascinating system of beliefs. And so, I don't know, I guess I tend to throw some of that into my storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Norse mythology as well. <laughs> if you didn't notice, my podcasting <laughs> last name is Midgard. <laughs> I did indeed. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. Odin or Thor? <sighs> Odin. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I even have, I don't know if you, you've probably seen it. If you've done any research into Norse mythology, oh, yeah. uh, it pops up on your feed where there's these hooded blankets that you can buy. They have a hood that you can wear on your head, but that you can wrap them around you as well. And mm -hmm. the vast majority of them are Norse themed. And so I bought one a couple of years ago. It's black and white and it has Odin's Ravens on it in nice. a very Norse kind of design. And it's, I love that blanket. I just, I don't know. I just love all of that. So yeah, definitely Odin. Munin and Hugin, I think their names yes, are. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Thor is like, the embodiment of might and the warrior spirit. But, you know, Odin, he hung himself from the great tree Yggdrasil. He basically committed suicide and hung there half dead so he could discover the mysteries of the runes. Like, I mean, his story is just far none better than any of the others, in my opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. But even Thor and even Loki, I mean, if you take out the Marvelization of these characters, they're very fascinating characters. I'm not going to say that Marvel movies are bad mm -hmm. or dumb or whatever. Their rendition of these characters is fun, but not necessarily true to life. And so I really do enjoy the old mythology a lot better than these modern kind of interpretations. Yeah, I mean, I'm not big on Marvel movies, so I haven't seen any of them. But uh, I seriously doubt that they include or even make reference to the story of Thor dressing as a woman to <laughs> infiltrate. I forget <laughs> what he was trying to get back. I think um, he was trying to get back. Oh, it was one of the stones. Of, and, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <It's> just strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also noticed that the story is set in Harper's Hollow and involves the Harper family. Were there any other recurring elements in the stories that I might have missed? And what is the significance of the connection between the story, Her First Time, and this story? So it's interesting that you asked that because you might have missed it in See No Evil at the end when he's reading Purcell's letter and Purcell says that the coven escaped to America. So, oh, okay, not in their time frame, but years ago, but some of the Harpers are still in England. He's chasing one down. He, and he thinks that's the character that's killing children. It might be a Harper. Yeah. That's the other reason that see no evil was broken out into chunks is because I wanted to have these other sprinklings of this fictional town thrown in there so that it were callbacks to that story. These three stories at least are all kind of interconnected. Yeah. And the blind witch is very important because as you first meet Madeline, she is blind. And then when you read A Frontier Haunting, you kind of read why that is. Then those two stories kind of correlate where she is absolutely a descendant of that same family from A Frontier Haunting. And I kind of wanted to explore this idea that you've got this powerful family behind the scenes they're not really good they're not really evil they're doing a little bit of both and you could look at her first time as maybe they're kind of menacing and bad with what she does but then in a frontier haunting they're helping a young girl in town and so they're in this instance being kind of altruistic and i kind of wanted to explore that dichotomy they don't view themselves as good or evil it's just a question of what their beliefs and their needs are. And some of those might be considered bad. Some of them might be considered good. Hmm. Well, from our last interview, which was quite a while ago, I remember at the time you had very limited writing time. Sometimes you're writing on your phone. Sometimes you got time on your computer and so on. So I don't know if that's still the case, but how long did it take you to write something this complex and cerebral? <laughs> That's still the case. <laughs> and a lot longer than I want to admit. Even in my introduction to the story, I talk about it where I am very much in awe of these authors that can sit down at their desk and they're like, okay, I'm going to write 10,000 words today. Uh -huh. And they write 10,000 words that day. That cannot, will not, does not happen for me. The amount of time I have to write is very limited. 
especially as my kids get older and they start having more interests in after school activities and stuff, I'm hardly ever home and I work long hours and I have a long commute. So a lot of my writing is done dictating into my phone or guerrilla style. I've got my laptop next to me and I'm typing furiously in between quarters of a game or in an intermission at a choir concert or something, mm. you know, but these stories never leave my head until they're done. And even then they tend to stick around a little bit. So for me, making them all interconnected wasn't that much of a stretch because they're already in my head anyways, but it can be kind of frustrating because I'll write something and then I'll go, oh crap. Okay. Well now that changes this. I got to go back to this other story that I thought was done and update this. It takes a while. This whole book took me about a year to write. Wow. That, I mean, that even seems like just the scale of it, the complexity of it, that even to me seems like a short amount of time. <laughs> it seems like it would have taken oh. longer. <laughs> <laughs> it probably could have. <laughs> well, one thing that truly impressed me about all of the stories is the period accurate dialect and colloquialisms. So could you share the extent of your research and the steps you took to accomplish what I would consider to be a pretty monumental task? It's interesting because I tend to hoard old words in my brain. I don't know why, but I'm the font of useless knowledge, especially <laughs> when it comes to words. I just love words. I don't necessarily read the dictionary for fun, but I mean, it's not that far from it where I'll be writing a story and I'm like, hey, I wonder if there's a better way to say this word. And I'll go look in Merriam-Webster's and sure as shit, there's 20 different ways to say this word. Okay. And now all 20 of those are stuck in my head for future possibility or future reference. But I also did a lot of reading of old classics from that time frame and quite a lot of recovered letters and correspondence from not just Victorian England, but even letters from the 20s, 30s and 40s that have been uploaded and scanned and just read through these. And to kind of get an idea of how did people talk to each other in a more informal setting? Because as authors, when we write fiction, we're not necessarily completely true to life. We're taking fictional license, if you will. But by reading correspondence, especially, you're not reading any of that fluff. You're not reading a Hollywood writer trying to make it dramatic. You're reading somebody who is literally just writing to somebody that's their friend or a loved one or a family member. And it's in true to life language. And that to me is very interesting because that's how these characters would interact in reality. So I wanted to make my characters feel like they were from that time frame by using words that people from that time frame legitimately used in the order that they used them in. So that was a lot of research as far as reading goes. I mean, you can watch old movies or movies that are taking place in a bygone era. But again, a lot of times that's kind of a Hollywood rendition. So it was a lot of correspondence is what I read. Hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, there's too many occurrences to count, but I was looking through the book here and I had highlighted one. Let's see. Where does it begin? He knew his patron would be arriving today, but did not expect her so early, nor did he expect her to find her lurking in the dark like a dodgy cut purse. <laughs> like, what the hell is a cut purse? <laughs> apparently. <Thief>. Yeah. <laughs> well, apparently, specifically a thief that would... Um, cut your money purse. Yeah. Cut, cut money strings. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So just stuff like that all through it. I was like, man, this is original. <laughs> it's fun. It's a lot of fun to again, put yourself in that mindset where they may not have had money purses hanging from their belts like they did in medieval times, but some people probably did up until the mid 1800s. And so cut purse may not be a legitimate thing anymore, but that vernacular would still be very prevalent in England at the time. Yeah. Well, how did your use of period specific language affect the process of writing dialogue? That's where it gets difficult because <laughs> it's, and as an editor, they'll look at it and go, well, you use 40 words to say what you could say in 15 mm -hmm. and true. But when you take into account, especially the old letters people wrote, they took 40 words to say what they could say in 15. That's just how it was back then. Uh -huh. So for me, it was always interesting to say, OK, how can I include dialogue that people can still understand today while using references and words from back then to make it sound official, sound like it's real? but also kind of evoke that time period. And so I have to sound it out of my head. I have to say it out loud. And so, yeah, I'm kind of talking to myself sometimes as I'm having these dialogues back and forth, these characters, I'm reading it out loud going, okay, that doesn't flow. That doesn't fit. No, that pause wouldn't be there because nobody would pause there, you know? So it is a process. Mm. 
probably a really disturbing process to those who see it from afar. <laughs> <laughs> Very tedious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, what is the story behind the Instagram post of your computer entitled autoerotic? <laughs> oh, so because I'm an idiot and I like to do things the hard way, but I'm also always trying to get better at my craft. The only way I'm going to be a great writer is if I continually push those boundaries. So autoerotic is a short story that I am writing or will have written, just waiting for the submission date to open up for an anthology of splatterpunk authors that are not writing splatterpunk per se. Mm. So it's a little edgier than what I normally write. It's a little more graphic than what I normally write. I don't have any problem with splatterpunk as a genre. It's just not something that I typically read, and it's certainly not something that I have ever written before. But I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy with the tale. I hope it gets accepted. Um, but I, this is me just pushing the boundaries and trying something new. I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, so did I understand correctly from another post on your Instagram that a specific Barnes and Noble store has Jack of all trades on its shelf? Yeah. The one in Bethlehem, what? Pennsylvania, we've got some good representation there for not just last waltz, which is the imprint that I'm on, but other independent authors. And it really makes my heart swell to see a big name store like Barnes and Noble taking such an interest in local and indie authors. I mean, I know that each store manager has some control over their store, but it was really cool to say, Hey, here's this, you know, global bookseller who's primarily going to be selling Oprah's book list and Stephen King stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But it really is nice to see them taking a vested interest in smaller authors. Cause I do think, if you look at all these indie authors out on the scene, and I know you know this, there's some amazing stuff out there that's just as good or if not better than established authors mm -hmm. in, you know, from the big name publishers. So I love the fact that they're taking such an interest. Yeah. Yeah. I come across books all the time where the thought comes into my head, like, you know what, somebody in Barnes and Noble right now looking for a thriller or a horror, or, you know, like they're a fan of Brett Easton Ellis. So they're looking for something transgressive and dark. They're never going to come across this. What I exactly. got. Exactly. And that's a shame. What a damn shame. <laughs> yep. Well, how is the family doing, sir? Good. Good. Kids are good. Yeah. Everything's good on this end. One of the reasons that I don't have time to write, and I do not regret it in the slightest, is that I love being a dad. And my kids, as they get older and their interests grow and expand, just blows my mind the stuff that they're interested in. And I'm always like, yes, try it. You don't have to stick with it if you don't like it, but at least say that you tried it. It's easier to regret something that you did do than that you didn't do. And I also never want them to feel like they missed out on something growing up. So I love that they're trying all these things, even though I'm hardly ever home. So be it. You know, this is what being a parent is all about. I want them to find themselves in the things that they're passionate about. And so that's what we're doing. And it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. There's everybody is happy and healthy. Nice. Well, Jack, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Same. So as we bring the show to a close, is there anything you'd like to plug or let your readers know about? Nothing to plug at the moment. I am slowly working on the sequel to Monochrome Noir. Mm. I am also in the process of starting to draft up the sequel to See No Evil. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about that. I do have a couple of anthologies that I am submitting for here shortly, including the one where autoerotic will be hopefully accepted. And then if they're accepted and I'm allowed to talk about it, then I'll host the various anthologies that I'm in. But for now, I'm still de-stressing after the holidays <laughs> and just getting back into the mindset of going back to some of these other worlds I've established and continuing on with those threads. Now, is the sequel to Monochrome Noir going to be released in kind of the serial smaller books, kind of like the old pulp magazines? I'm debating that. I'm not sure yet. Because okay. we're actually thinking about re-releasing Monochrome Noir as an omnibus. Okay. So if that does come to pass, this book, depending on how it's laid out, if it feels like it could be serialized, then I may go that route again. I rather enjoy that route. Uh -huh. Some people might not have, but I did. But if it doesn't flow quite that way, if it just feels like it needs to be a cohesive story, then I'll just release it as one big book. All right. 
Well, we will all keep an eye out for that. So listeners at home, all links are in the description. And Jack, thank you again for joining me. Thanks for having me. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday when I will be joined by a writer who has written a darkly humorous story straight from the pit of hell. So until then, stay healthy, stay sane, and as always, thank you for listening. See you next time.